tēnā koto, i nā rangatira, i nā iwi o te runanga o kaitahu kanui nā mihi ki a koto. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato katoa. My name is Jim Sinner. My river is the Red River of the North in North Dakota, USA. I've been in New Zealand for just about 30 years now. Um, and I currently live in Nelson and work at the Cawthorn Institute, where I'm uh, a team leader for social science policy and planning work. And I've been asked to talk to you about why managing water quality is so hard. Um, and I'll give you some reflections and observations about um, things in an, in an urban context. Uh, I don't pretend to have the the breadth and depth of expertise that, that Jan does and, and probably some other people in the room. But I'll try and, and share some thoughts with you about, about the challenges of, of managing water quality in, in urban environments with a couple of references to, to rural environments as well. Is this the, is this working? Here we go. So I guess the, the first thing I wanted to point out is that the major cause, or certainly a major cause, of poor water quality in both rural and urban environments is what we call diffuse pollution. Some people call it non-point source pollution. It's the runoff from many thousands and thousands of small dispersed sources, be they rooftops of commercial and residential buildings, roads, industrial sites, building sites, farm paddocks, forests. All of these um, create uh, small amounts of runoff that they accumulate. And the, the key feature of diffuse pollution is that for the individual property owners, the pollution and its effects are typically invisible. And it's all but impossible to measure and monitor on a regular basis. It runs down a driveway, into a drain, and disappears without any further thought. But the nutrients, the sediment, the heavy metals, and bacteria accumulate and they cause significant impacts on our streams, our rivers, wetlands, our lakes and estuaries, and into the coastal marine environment. And in all the discussion about water quality, we often overlook the importance of structure and structural habitat of our streams. And structure is as important as water quality for creating the healthy aquatic ecosystems that are so important to provide the, the functions that these streams and, and rivers can provide. So we, we shouldn't forget about, um, about the structure as well. A second feature of, of why urban water quality is so difficult is that it's in the urban environment is it's obviously largely determined by urban form. And as we've been discussing, it's very expensive. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of very expensive and long-lived fixed assets streets, buildings, sewer and stormwater systems and like. Resource regi regional councils um, can issue consents to territorial authorities for stormwater discharges, but the property owners themselves are not engaged in that process. And often the, the TAs themselves aren't, um, aren't really accountable for the water quality effects of those discharges. Some, a lot of permit, um, Stormwater discharges are permitted activities with only um, very broad conditions for that, that prohibit gross um, pollution effects but don't deal with, with the cumulative effects. And so effectively, there's no accountability for the quality of those discharges. Similar things apply to discharges from roads. The conditions simply repeat the, the conditions in Section 70 of the RMA and, and don't really provide accountability to those asset owners. Engineers have been focused over many years on drainage, drainage and flood risk rather than on water quality and the effects of discharges on stream ecology and, um, and related functions. The, the design options that, that Yandis has talked about, the water sensor design, are not in most engineers' toolbox. It's, this is something that, that hasn't been part of the training. It's not part of their mindset. They look to other, other tools and devices when they start thinking about managing stormwater. Developers don't incur, don't have incentives 
to think about these things either. They're mostly interested in minimizing cost and getting sections on the market as quickly as possible. Um, and so they also don't bear the, the consequences of the impacts on the waterways. They develop a subdivision, sell the sections, and disappear, and the impacts on waterways emerge only after. And so the result we get is what's sometimes called the urban stream syndrome. We have um, a lot of urban streams with, with wide stream beds, steep banks, exposed soil or concrete, exotic grasses or trees on the margins, and low water level relative to bank height. And the result is flashy flows, E. coli, sediment weeds, and a generally poor habitat for aquatic, uh, aquatic organisms. And I also might also add that in, in a lot of smaller sediments, we have a lot of septic tanks that are largely uncontrolled. Again, permitted activities with very few conditions and very little consideration given to whether cumulative, cumulative effects are occurring and, and need to be addressed. But there are some reasons for some optimism. Urban form can be influenced, at least at the margins, by city planners. Developers can determine the form of new neighborhoods, influenced by council rules. Engineers can make changes as, is, as infrastructure is replaced, maintained, or upgraded. And although the overall change might be slow, we can have faster change in targeted areas. And so we can get road designs with um, you know, quite attractive vegetation and, and verges that, that filter a lot of runoff. And things around homes that um, you can have rain barrels and rain gardens and, and surfaces that are permeable rather than impermeable that treat the runoff at source rather than letting it run down the driveway and into a drain. So there are, there are things we can do. So I guess that raises the question, how do we get people to, to adopt these things? How do we, how do we change the way that, that property owners and developers and council engineers think about these things? Human behavior is very complex, and it's not a simple matter of a rational calculation to maximize utility, as um, some ec economists might suggest. And I'm trained as an economist myself, so I bear some of the baggage of, of that training. But people are motivated by, motivated by a lot more than just money. And it's important to understand the multiple things that drive behavior change in thinking about what kind of policies will be effective in achieving the outcomes that we want. This diagram is, um, is a representation of some work by Ajahn and Fishbein, which is quite widely cited in the behavior change literature. Um, this particular diagram is put together by some colleagues, Will Allen and, and Margaret Kilvington, who work out of Christchurch and, and uh, Littleton. And the, I mean, I would draw things a little bit differently. I'd, you know, I'd connect the financial centers over here to ability to act and the pressure to act. But essentially, the, the main point here is that we can, we can think of behavior change as, as mainly driven by, by three different aspects of, of people's perceptions. It's their attitudes towards the action or their understanding. It's their ability to carry out um, different ways of doing things. And it's the, the imperative to, to do those things. So I tend to boil it down to, to this simple equation, that, that motivation to change is a function of understanding, ability, and imperative. So it's an understanding of the problem and the situation that requires changing and, and why it requires changing and what their individual role is in that problem. That's the understanding. The ability is their, is their physical and practical and financial ability to actually make the change. Do they know how to do it? Do they have the money it takes to do it? Do they have the time to do it? And finally, the imperative is why am I going to make the change? It may be a good thing to do, but if I, unless I have a, a really strong reason to do it, I'm, I've got other things in my life to get on with, and I may, it's just not going to prioritize it. So it may be a legal requirement. It may be a financial incentive or a disincentive, or it may be peer pressure. It may be that all your neighbors are doing it, and, and they're looking at you and saying, well, come on, you stop dragging the chain. There are many different ways you can create that imperative, but you have to have that imperative in place. So if we stop and think just for a moment about our rural catchments and 
the challenge of behavior change there. Again, the, the policy problem is how do we get landowners to change their practice? And for decades, counts have relied on voluntary approaches to address diffuse pollution. They provided information and advice, sometimes financial subsidies, but it's pretty clear that it hasn't worked. The good efforts by many have been outpaced by, by the continued growth and intensification by others and our water quality and our, our habitats in, in rural areas are declining. So let's stop and think about what the different components are and um, why it's not working. Do, do, do people understand the problem? Science is contested by advocacy groups and it's always not always clear what needs to be done to address the problem. And so people say, well, I'm not sure what's going on here. I'll just kind of hold tight and see what's going to happen next. Some changes have substantial costs involved, either, either in time or money or maybe new skills. And often it requires a coordinated effort across many landowners in the, in the same catchment to make a real difference. And if you haven't got all those ingredients, people can say, well, um, it's too hard. And finally, what's the imperative to change? Things have been voluntary, they haven't been mandatory, social pressure is weak, and the result is not much happens. Little progress again, um, many people doing good work, but the overall effect being, um, being overwhelmed by intensification by others. So let's think about, I guess I'd ask a question here at the bottom, do our, do our regional plans that are now emerging under the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, do they address those three components? I think every region should be asking ourselves, are we actually getting understanding, the ability to, to make the change, and the imperatives right to create the change we hope to see in our rural landscapes. What about in our urban landscapes? As we all know, urban form is very hard to change. There's a different dynamic going on here. We have long legacy effects of infrastructure and urban form, and it's hard to change the design of streets and buildings and parking lots, but it's not impossible. There are new techniques of water sensitive design that we can uh, start using as we replace and maintain and, and build new infrastructure. And you have to ask yourself, why are these new techniques not already being required in, in new developments? We should, I would suggest, as a minimum for new developments, insist upon full mitigation of adverse effects on water um, at source. If we, if we don't demand that in our new developments, we have absolutely no hope of maintaining water quality and, and uh, aquatic habitat in our urban environments. No hope whatsoever. If we, don't main, if we don't insist on absolute best practice in new developments and set the standard there, why would anybody in, in the other, other neighborhoods say, why should they do anything? We have to set an example in the new neighborhoods and say, this is, this is where things are headed. This is best practice. This is where we all need to go. We have a mindset that stormwater and wastewater are the council's responsibilities and managed by building more pipes. We have to change that mentality to a mentality that is actually the individual's responsibility to look after the effects that their property is having on, on waterways. So again, I come back to those three different elements of behavior change. Understanding, ability, and imperative. How do we improve people's understanding? I would suggest we should show people where their stormwater goes. Let's build those network maps and get out and have conversations with people about where their water off their property drains to and what receiving waters are being impacted by, by those drains. Let's get some stream care groups and demonstration projects going that show people both the impacts of current practice and the alternatives that are available to change those impacts. Let's improve people's ability to change. Let's consider providing some technical assistance with design of, of new options. That may be for developers. It may be for people who are um, redeveloping their or renovating their, their residential section. Let's give them some free advice on how they can do things differently. Maybe we provide some subsidies or, or rate rebates for water sensitive design. And maybe we um, have offered professional development engineers to 
to show our, our engineers some of these new options that are, that are available so that they have more tools in their toolbox to do things differently. So how do we strengthen the imperative to change? Again, I think that stormwater charges uh, with some rebates for water sensor design could be part of that mix. I suggest we should require water sensor design on all new developments, 100% mitigation at source, uh, treatment at source. Tighten the rules on septic tanks and phases in over time. And try and get the social, the social marketing, the social pressure working in our, in our favor. Create a demonstration effect by, by doing, um, doing things in, in certain neighborhoods where you can demonstrate the way that things be done better, beautify our street states, street streetscapes, and encourage people to think that this is the way that everyone wants their neighborhood to have. They, they want their neighborhood to be. Create demand for water center design and create a race at to the top rather than a race at to the bottom. So that everybody wants their neighborhood to be the best rather than just having bare streets. We do have to be, be conscious that different communities have different abilities to pay and um, lower income neighborhoods might need some assistance. How does the regional council incentivize the, the territorial authorities to do this? I think pretty clear we need a partnership approach. Um, and councils need to work together, regional and, and local. But the regional council does set the expectations through its regional plans about what the community aspires to and wants to achieve. And I do think it is the regional council's responsibility to, to set those expectations for the wider community. Um, those are done through water quality targets, through the whole of catchment, by looking at cumulative effects and load limits, by requiring water sensor design and, and new developments, um, performance standards for stormwater discharges, and rules for septic tanks discharges. And it's important to remember that the regional councils have the function under the RMA of controlling land use for the effects on water quality. We have this mindset that territorial authorities do land use and regional councils do water and air and hazards and everything else, but that land use is a district council and, and city council function. Regional councils also have functions that deal with land, to, to manage land use for the effects on water quality. So regional councils could put, I would argue, um, rules in the plan that say if you're developing a new subdivision, you're required to mitigate those effects at source. That isn't just a district council and city council function. Regional councils can get involved in that conversation as well. So just to summarize, urban form is difficult. Um, but it's not impossible to change. Behavior change is driven by kind of three groups of, of drivers, and it's important to, to remember all three of those and to think about your policies in that context. Build partnerships with between regional councils and territorial authorities to build awareness of stormwater and its impacts. And the regional council should be setting expectations through its policies and plans for example, requiring full mitigation in new developments. And my kind of aspirational message is create a race to the top where every neighborhood wants to have water sensor design so that they can mitigate their impacts on freshwater bodies in the coastal environment. Kia ora.